This conference will now be recorded. Morning, my name is Greg Wadley with CTC and Associates, and I'm the Clear Roads Administrator. We're here for the final uh, webinar for the project entitled Expanding Application Rate Guidance for Salt Brine Blends and Direct Liquid Application in Anti-Icing. Uh, this research effort is led by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before I turn it over to the research team, I want to let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Clear Roads website at a later date for viewing at your convenience. We also ask that everybody stays on mute so that there's no background noise. However, if you have any comments or questions, please enter them into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the presentation. I do believe that's all the housekeeping items, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Noyce. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Greetings from sunny and warm Madison, Wisconsin this morning here. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to work with you on this project. We're excited to present to you our findings here as we get towards the end. Um, let me introduce our team here, and maybe we'll just go ahead and start with that, and then we'll go through the presentation and see what questions you have when we get to the end here. But my name is David Noyce. I'm a professor of transportation engineering here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I also have the privilege of directing the TOPS lab, which is the, the key research element that all of our team members here are part of. Andrea Bill, who, who led the day-to-day the -day, day -day effort of the project and was instrumental in what you will hear about, will also make the presentation. And, um, and you'll hear more from Andy here in just a second. But our other team members were Madhav Chachuri, Boris Kleros, and we also had Wilfred Nixon, part of the, the research team. So we're excited to present it to you. Look forward to your questions. And Andy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Hopefully, everybody can hear me OK. I'm seeing some um, orange come through. Can you guys still hear me? Yep, we're just fine. OK, perfect. Thank you. It's always a little bit disconcerting when I can see the, the yellow and the, and the red come, come up on my screen here. Um, well, thank you very much for, for being here. As Dr. Noyce mentioned, we're here to talk about our expanding application rate guidance for salt brine blends for directed liquid application and anti-icing. It does seem a little odd to be giving this presentation when we're supposed to be getting 60s here this week. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, so we'll be talking about, you know, just some things that you guys are probably all aware of here. So when we think about winter maintenance decision making, we have these kind of things that are happening, right? So we have an increased cost that's happening, that's happening all across the um, system a little bit. We have limited budgets. So while the cost is increasing, our budgets are not increasing. And then we have, you know, more knowledge and more um, experience in understanding the environmental concerns when it comes to winter maintenance. So there's definitely a motivation for sustainable and cost effective practices. Um, with these changes, there can be kind of in the, you know, changes in the traditional practice may be challenging. Um, we have new practices with liquids. We have new equipment that comes along with this. We need to make sure that we're doing our staff training and education. And along with any change to the, the status quo, we have to make sure we have community involvement. We want to let people know why we're doing the things that we're doing and the high level of research that goes in, involved in this, right? So a lot of times communities, I think, um, just think that we are just doing this to do it versus all of the extensive uh, data collection that you guys all helped us do here as we move through it. And we also have this high expectations on level of service. We want to make sure that we are definitely providing the level of service to our customers for both a operations and a safety aspect of it. As I go through my presentation today, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat pod. Um, our team is here, and, and if I miss it, I'm sure they will let me know and we'll come back to it here. So we're going to start with some um, kind of environmental impacts, and this is done by one of our professors here in luminology at the University of Wisconsin. And what it's showing is just the kind of all of the lakes, eight lakes illustration, and the long-term chloride trends. We know that urban land cover increases our chloride concentrations. And the, for, the forested landscape has kind of stable concentrations. We have conclusive evidence of effective chlorides in our waters, our microorganisms, and our fish and plants. So this is just one aspect of um, chloride use that we really want to make sure that we're considering and trying to determine what we can do best for the environment. The research needs have this kind of limited guidance on application rates. We know what it happens on a liquid de-icing to, you know, wh where is that guidance on liquid de-icing at low to moderate temperatures and then diverse roadway conditions. 
We also know that um, the materials in liquid form is, is kind of varied and across the board, right? So we want to look at typical salt brine that I'll be talking about. So this is sodium chloride. I'll also be talking about um, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, and then agro-based byproducts as well too. So we'll be covering kind of four of those. Um, I'll talk about them not blended, which is just means water and one of these together, um, or I'll talk about blended, which is kind of a combination of these is through. So these are kind of the materials that we're going to be talking about in liquid form. So this means putting this together, um, these kind of salt materials in with water. Our project scope, we looked at a survey of practice. We wanted to document existing practice from different jurisdictions. So we sent out a survey, which we'll talk about. Um, again, for those of you on the call that helped us with that, whether it was um, filling out our survey or providing us data collection, we thank you for that. This research couldn't have been done without you. We wanted to expand the liquid application guidance. We wanted to collect and analyze field data. We want to we wanted to, and we did identify commonly used liquid blends and applications. And then through that, we wanted to make sure we had the practitioner involvement. Those of you guys who are in the field fighting these winter storms have a great experience. We wanted to make sure we validated our field observations. So what we were collecting in our field data, since we weren't able to go out and kind of um, collect the data ourselves, we wanted to make sure that we had a chance to um, validate those field observations by talking to our practitioners. And then we wanted to raise awareness about specific conditions to try to understand a little bit more about um, the limitations with using um, liquid brine. So this was our um, work plan. Um, you can see task there was project management. Phase one included that literature review, that survey of practice, and the field testing protocols. We then moved into tasks four and five, which was field data collection. And task five was the development um, of the application rate guidance. And then task six is what we're wrapping up today here. We have our final report and our webinar. So we thank you guys for, for being a part of our process throughout, throughout the time here. So our task one, and all of this is in our final report here, but just wanted to give you an overview of what's included in it, is our literature review. It included application rates, performance measures that different folks are, are using or what's out there, the chemical products, um, really looking into the environmental impacts of different salt um, characteristics, corrosion, impacts on concrete and asphalt, the various agro-based products, and then any literature that was already looking at cost-benefit analysis of using the brine pro of using brine products. Our task two was that survey of practice. So we had um, an overview which talked about the different materials that are being used, um, the predominant winter conditions that the agencies were seeing and looking at. Um, their liquid application rates, if they had anything in, in writing or what they were kind of experiencing through that, um, their experience with brine. Um, were they looking at or collecting any performance measures currently? And then through that survey, we also asked if they had any potential sites for field data collection. We did the survey design, was um, supported on the online Qualtrics software that the UW has um, a contract with. The survey distribution was um, a lot through you guys and, and through folks that you know. So again, thanks for that. We looked at personnel with fast experience in winter maintenance across the United States. We wanted to make sure we weren't just covering kind of in the snow belt, but all the way um, both east and west and, and north and south as much as we could. We uh, first distributed it on Monday, September 28th, 2020. Um, we did a second round um, kind of a little less than a month later. Um, we sent reminders out and we closed the survey on October 28th. Um, as of October 28th, we had 33 responses. Two responses were incomplete. We had respondents both from um, local and state agencies, which I think is important to, to capture, right, because state agencies and locals might have different experience of this. Um, we did have six out of 33 respondents were from one state agency, and um, 10 agencies indicated their willingness to participate in the study. So through our respondents, we saw that 94% of agencies use liquid applications. 70% of the respondents indicated um, 
their agency use liquid applications at all pavement temperatures, at pavement temperatures, sorry, below 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there is some guidance, 67% had guidance on when to use liquids. 11 respondents submitted actual their guidance documents and used at their agencies, and this is included in our final report as well. And then here's our kind of commonly used materials throughout the process here. And so you can see we have, um, you know, salt brine, solid salt, pre-wet magnesium chloride, Biomelt Boost, Geomelt, Beet Juice, and other agro byproducts as well, too. When we looked at kind of the liquid application guidance and the practices, what we saw was that for pavement temperatures, liquids were commonly used at pa pavement temperatures be between 20 and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We saw that um, most agencies would avoid using liquids at pavement temperatures below 20 degrees. Um, but we did have four agencies use liquids at pavement temperatures below 15. And that's kind of what our um, research study was kind of looking at was those lower temperatures and looking at it. Um, liquids and solids, we had 47% use liquid in combination with solid applications. I'll refer to that as shake and bake. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can um, think about shake and bake. So we do have some agencies that have one truck that can put down um, the salt and then in that same truck then kind of spray down the brine on top of that solid salt. We have some agencies that have, um, a, you know, maybe a salt truck that goes out first and then the brine truck that follows or vice versa. So shake and bake, um, the terminology there, I think, think makes me think of Talladega Nights, but the shake and bake that we're talking about here is really thinking about the combination of solid applications within liquid kind of separately associated with it. 39% um, used extremely heavy pre-wetting at up to 70 gallons, a kind of a slurried mix a little bit. Um, so we can kind of think about that as well too. At the bottom, like the last um, bullet there, shows kind of the, the blends that are looking at it. So 90% brine, 85% brine, 80%. 10% um, boost for cold weather applications. So you can see this, we use straight salt brine. Um, so you can kind of see all those different combinations that were of uh, those blends that were um, mentioned on the survey of practice. The performance measures that are kind of used currently by respondents were the amount of salt used, that was 28%, time to bear wet, 21%, cost of materials used, 1%, um, friction, uh, testing friction may be overrepresented from the 12 agencies, um, kind of they were from the same location, but um, so four response were from the same agency associated with that. And we'll talk a little bit about um, time to bear wet and friction testing here in a couple other slides. Other performance measures that um, agencies are currently using are cycle times, level of service, traffic volumes. Um, I think that, you know, this idea of performance measures is a, a hot topic that's out there, whether we're thinking about operations or safety associated with it. And I think that kind of really um, better understanding these performance measures is helpful, not only for our own talking with our customers so they can understand. Tools that are commonly used in Wintner maintenance um, include AVL, so um, automatic vehicle location, video feeds, and other systems such as RWIS, which stands for Road Weather Information System. So our, we asked about project data collection and kind of saying, would you be willing to help us out? So we had 10 agencies um, already had experience with liquid applications. They indicated their willingness to participate in the study, collect and provide the data. Um, we didn't have any agencies that were planning on implementing liquids willing to provide data. So ones that kind of were brand new to this, we didn't have anybody. We were more thinking about, eight, or we had more agencies that were already had experience be a part of this. We did have some follow-up calls to try to get some more information. Um, you know, would personnel be willing to share internal information about commonly used application rates, um, agencies that indicated their willingness to participate in the study, and then gathering more information and coordinating efforts for possible site visits and data collection. So that's what happened in our follow-up calls. We move then into our field testing protocols. And so what we were looking for um, was just one route selection. We wanted to make sure that we're getting good information out there about the application rates of these different products. And so we were looking to say, you know, could we get some routes that had some homogeneity, so sections of roadway that have consistent functional classifications, operations, and geometry. 
Um, we wanted to make sure that there was easy accessibility. So was there proximity and ability of Whitner maintenance equipment to reach that roadway segment in a, in a kind of relatively quick time frame? Uh, so the ability to then monitor and perform frequent liquid like applications. And then, you know, was there other data available to, with it to look at it. So, you know, was there information about traffic and speed data collections at stations at any part of the route? And then did they have any um, maintenance decision support system or and or friction testing available at those sites for that field testing side of it? Um, when we think about our route selection, we did, you know think about 25 miles or long. We want one to three lanes by direction, varied functional classifications, geometry, traffic conditions, speed limits, and then from different geographical regions. We wanted to make sure that all of our um, data just wasn't from one area on one one mile section of roadway, right? We wanted to make sure we had some variety in looking at that to say, you know, if we're going to help put out some guidance or, or capture this information. How do we make sure that it's um, as representative as possible and looking at it. So that's really what we were kind of trying to, to look at. We had forms that went along with it. These are all again in our um, final report. We had one that was kind of a one-time submission that just asked for segment information, you know, what is the name, location, all of that stuff that kind of went along with it. And then we had um, data collection forms through a, for all the storm data. So this was looking at our events, materials, blends, amount used, application rates, frequency of application, and, and if there was any performance measures that were covered with it. So here we can see our field data collection, our agents, our state, our agency, and our, and our storms. Again, thank you guys, all of you who provided data. Um, we can't do any of this research without you guys. So really, thank you, thank you, thank you on that. Um, so you can see here we had nine states, 17 agencies, 31 study routes, and 167 storms. So this was, this was amazing information. So thank you guys all for that. And you can see here we've got um, Oregon out west and then Utah. And then we have our Idaho, Nebraska, Minnesota, Michigan, and then we move out um, on to Michigan and kind of in West Virginia and Wisconsin as well, too. So you can see we do have a couple of um, a little further east than just the Midwest there with West Virginia. As we then moved into some of our development of guidance, I want to cover some um, performance measures that we were looking at here. Um, so this was looking at our pavement friction. So we had two locations. This is just showing what um, Jefferson County did here in Wisconsin um, and then examining it that way. So this is done through a, a friction reading on the vehicle. The frictions range from zero to one. The, the zero has lower friction um, and then the one is higher friction. It's, it has an asterisk next to it because it's um, kind of a computated friction values. They're looking at it. It's uh, a high tech video that's kind of pushing down, or sorry, not video, but device that's collecting the information that bounce back associated with it. And what we can see here is that um, Jefferson had our brine route, and then um, so they call it kind of a grip factor things. Um, Jefferson had the liquid brine on it, and then the Dane County was kind of our control route. So you can see that the average friction in, in Jefferson County for the, the route that we looked at there was 0.70, and then the Dane um, route, which was our control route, had 0.651. So we saw kind of a 8.1% um, increase in kind of that grip or that fric average friction between our treatment and our control route. And this was important for us to gather and look at, and we're still going through the data. It was a very rich data source, which is great for us in looking at this, because what we were hearing from our, especially our law enforcement, is that they had concerns that putting liquid brine down was affecting the safety on our roadways, that putting that kind of watery type liquid on it would result in less friction and, and cause more um, crashes and looking at it. So we wanted to make sure we had some hard numbers to be able to look at that and be able to analyze it. Make sure we get our eyes checked here. This is like a Snellen chart here looking at it. So this was just um, to show you one kind of um, you know, variety of storms. And what it's looking at here is that our orange bars are our um, Sorry, our orange bars are looking at it from the um, the treatment 
routes. So these are our brine routes. And then the blue bars here are our control routes. And what you can see is that for most of it, we saw the treatment routes to be higher, have a higher friction than our control routes. But there are a couple, um, you can't see my, my mouse here, but I'm all the way kind of on the right hand side right after 216 in that time frame where the blue is a little higher than the orange. And so again, we want to kind of understand a little bit more about those kind of edge cases and looking at it a little bit more to kind of say what's happening in that storm compared to the others where the fr that friction, that grip value changed a little bit. So really great source of information here to better understand um, some of the nuances with these storms. Okay, moving now into our development of guidance that we wanted to look at here. This, this table here that I'm showing isn't our guidance. This was um, came out from the Clear Roads Research Project 15-01. Um, it's a materials application methodologies guidebook, and this is looking at light snow, so less than one inch um, per hour or less than four inches in a 24-hour period. And you can see the pavement temperature on the left. What is the trend? Is it going, um, you know, higher or lower, and then what is the road surface condition, and then the liquid in gallons per lane mile, sodium chloride, uh, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, and then the salt pounds per lane. Um, the NR was, you know, not, we, we talked about, you know, is it really not recommended or not available, right? So for this study here that was done, um, those yellow segments there were ones that there was not data available for, and you can see some of the NRs on the other sides. So we we were kind of hoping to focus on those yellow areas, that research focus, those yellow highlighted um, cells there. So that's what we kind of started our, our work with. This was our field data um, characteristics. So as I mentioned, we had that 167 storms that we wanted to look at. We had a majority of storms with light snow conditions. Snowfall is less than 0.5 inches per hour. So you can see we've got our pavement temperatures and our snowfall in inches per hour associated with there. You know, as, as we know, as the temperatures get lower, that snowfall is not going to be as high. Um, so we kind of that's expected as we fight these winter storms. Okay, so then we moved into using our field data collection that we gathered. We had um, information about pavement temperatures, roadway surface condition, and materials. We'll have that that I'll talk about. Um, with any of this work, we again, we wanted to make sure we had practitioner involvement. So we wanted to make sure we talked to folks that had extensive experience with liquid applications. We wanted to share our observed field-based application rates to make sure that that, you know, kind of met the gut test associated with it, providing feedback um, to us. So we did kind of an iterative process with it. We had some validation of application rates as we went through this. We wanted to raise awareness about specific conditions that we were seeing, especially those low temperature conditions and looking at it. Um, and then we did do some, and, and you'll see, and I'll make sure I mention it, when we have the guidance for the shake and bake, this was adjusted based on the feedback that we saw. Um, it was looking at it to say um, what our field data collection values were weren't matching what our practitioners were kind of dealing with a little bit. And so we had some, we adjusted those values based on the feedback that we got from our uh, technical advisory committee. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll again mention that when we get to that table, the guidance for all other application baits were, were based on field data um, only. I know that was complicated I'll, when we get there. So as I get to these next tables, these, uh, the data that's in these tables and that kind of application rate that's associated there in that uh, fourth column, that liquid gallons per lane mile, um, are from field data collection only, and these have been validated by our experts, our technical advisory committee. So what you'll see here is these next set of tables that give um, some information about um, the guidance and application rates, and we'll talk about what it is. So this one is for salt brine. Um, with snow that's less than one inch per hour or less than four inches um, in a 24 hour period. And what we have set up here is you can see the pavement temperature, the trend, the road surface condition, very similar to what you saw in the table from the previous um, 
the previous reports. But then we also have here the, the storms, the number of storms that this was um, gathered through, the locations, and then the states associated or the agencies associated with it. So as you're thinking about how to implement this, right? So research is all well and good, but we really want to get to that implementation period of it. You may be looking at this and saying, okay, what is, you know, what are some areas that kind of have similar characteristics to me? And then looking at these application rates or these application tables to be able to help it. So, um, you know, for example, here, if you're in the, um, you see a very high number of, um, move this out of my, we have 10 locations um, in the 25 to 32 degree range. We're kind of remaining in that range for that temperature for that storm period. It's a light snow clover. And we had um, liquid of salt brine in the 40 to 65 gallons per lane mile kind of application rate associated with it. And we have 37 storms with 10 different locations. So again, some good information there. Sorry. Oh. There. Okay. Um, make sure I, just, I think the 24 and 25 look the same here. Okay. Um, slide 26 here. This was again without blending. So this is just water with magnesium chloride here. So this is light snow, same characteristics. Um, what you can see here is your pavement temperature, your trend, your road surface condition again. And then this was um, kind of that 30 gallons per lane mile magnesium chloride um, kind of throughout that system. So whether it was 20 to 25, 25 to 32 or 32, and you can see kind of that maybe that smaller number of storms and locations, um, we think Oregon to be able to help us get this data. Looking at the liquid applications with blending. So what you can see here in these next couple of tables is the fourth column now will say kind of what that blend is. So we have the sodium chloride and the calcium chloride, the 90-10 blend. So 90% um, sodium chloride and then the 10% calcium chloride associated with it. And then you can see again those application rates. So the pavement temperature between 20 and 25, kind of remaining in that range, light snow cover. We have that 20 to 45 gallons per lane mile. And then the agencies that provided us data. So thank you for that. And then the 15 to 20. So as we go kind of lower temperatures, you'll see that more folks were using some blending in that lower temperatures. This is salt brine and geo melt. So we can see the 80 20 blend associated with this one. And you can see those um, gallons per lane mile looking at it. And then this is a, um, another blending um, data that we had. And this is um, salt brine, calcium chloride, and geo melt, an 80 10 10 blend, uh, blend with it. And then the pavement temperatures. Um, so the 15 to 20, they had that 40, and then um, and the 0 to 15, we had 45. So thank you, Farmington Hills, for this data. Okay. So you can see here the yellow box with the asterisk. I want to make sure that we kind of specify this out. So all of the tables prior to this were directly from our field applications um, and looking at that data from there from the field. As we looked at our shake and bake liquid and solid applications together, we had some field data that we revised based on our expert feedback because we were getting some pretty crazy numbers and some and some values and outliers. And so we really wanted to make sure that we took time to gather the input of our experts to be able to update this table itself. So this is the only table that um, the field data has been revised based on expert feedback. And this is all mentioned in that final report here. So you can see our liquid um, gallons per lane mile um, of our brine and then the dry salt that went down with it and the, the dry salts in that um, pounds per lane mile and looking at it. And then you can see the different, again, pavement temperatures, the ranges, the storms and locations and the agency. So we try to keep the tables all in similar format through it um, and making sure that we captured all of it through it so that you guys can get to the right table associated for your jurisdiction based on your pavement temperature, your trend, and then your road surface condition. 
So our final report in our webinar that we are today, as I um, kind of gave an overview of our literature review, the survey of practice, the field data, the application rates, um, that practitioner feedback that we included from, um, that we gathered from our practitioners, and then the appendices in the final report include all of those application rate guidance that we talked about, the survey questions, the contact information, and all of the field data collection forms. So that's all in the final report and what we went over today. And then this is our contact information here with it. So um, I didn't see any questions come up in the chat pod, but at this point in time, Greg, should I turn it back over to you to um, kind of facilitate any questions or comments? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, so um, like Andy said, there was no, there were no uh, questions or comments in the chat pod. Uh, so uh, you still have an opportunity to do that if you'd like, or um, if you guys want to come off mute one at a time and um, ask any questions or provide any comments, you're certainly welcome to do so. Hello, this is Cliff Boonmore in Wyoming, or YDOT. Uh, this is gonna be very helpful for us to see all those charts that you had with the application rates because many of our guys are asking what do we apply at and when and those will sure give us some guidelines that we hadn't had before they're, there's they're out there it's just hard for them to find it this is kind of a one-stop shop so thank you very much thank you for that i appreciate that Anybody else? Greg, it Greg, seems I, like Andy did such a good job. There's no questions. I was gonna say, I've got a question. If, <laughs> <laughs> Ask yourself. Yeah, uh, now, Greg, I have a question for you. So um, to get this available and out to the folks, I know that our final report's still kind of uh, pending a little bit. Are are we able to, so like if Cliff wants these tables now, are we able to provide the um, presentation out to him at least or to folks or how does this kind of get wrapped up so folks can possibly use this in this next um, winter if, if it ever comes again I know I know you guys out west got some snow recently but man oh man it's been it's been pretty warm here in Wisconsin yeah uh, so uh, one of the things I'll ask is if you guys could send me the PowerPoint and I will also post that on the members only side of the website like I do with all completed projects um, this one will be uh, the recording, as I noted at the beginning, it will also be posted on the project page, the bottom of the project page, uh, like we do with all of our completed projects. And then, of course, the, um, the draft final report is also available to all members of Clear Roads because it's on the members only page under research project documents. So uh, until we actually finalize it and post the final report, that will stay there. Uh, once that final report is published and posted on the public facing side of the website, then just the uh, PowerPoint slides are available on the members only side. So uh, everybody has access to any uh, part of this that they want um, sort of from this point going forward. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, well, hearing uh, or seeing no questions uh, up beyond uh, Cliff and Cliff, thank you for that. Uh, I think we will go ahead and wrap this up again. I'll get, a, I'll get this posted this week and just really appreciate everybody uh, for your time and uh, have a happy holidays. Thank you so much, everybody.